Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our FinTalk series. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, in our FinTalk series, we feature trending topics and prominent speakers in our FinTech Bay ecosystem. And our speakers today will engage in approximately about 30 minute live session. And following that, you can please feel free to submit questions in the question and A chat. Uh, it's very important that you actually use the Q&A button to tab to be able to get the us to see your questions. I will help as well answer those with our speakers. Um, yes, and if we don't answer all your questions, you can also contact us on info at bahrainfintechbay.com and we can answer them for past this uh, webinar as well. Um, good afternoon. Please also tell us, let us know where you're from and where you're joining from. It's uh, very important for us to, to us know as well where our audience and what, who we're communicating with. So as we know, the global pandemic has resulted in a huge increase in the use of digital services for financial services, increasing the pressure on traditional firms to engage with clients in new and more dynamic ways. In this session, we'll be discussing how firms can ramp up their innovation efforts to meet the new needs of customers. I am Susie Zira, and I'm the head of communication and events at Bahrain Fintech Bay. And with me today, I have Nikolai Hack. Uh, prior to joining Nukuro as one of the founding team, uh, Nikolai spent a number of years as a management and political consultant, gaining extensive experience across European blue chip clients and international organizations. He has spent the majority of his career focusing on operational excellence and process optimization projects. And at Nakuro, he focuses on the operational aspects of the business, which include customer support and excellence, operations and integrations, compliance, and finance and legal. Welcome, Nikolai. Hello, hi. Hi. And with us also have Dr. Yusuf Almas, who is the Group Chief Innovation Officer at Bank ABC. He's responsible for driving the innovation agenda and supporting the digital transformation of the Bank ABC's group. And prior to this post, he was the Chief Digital Officer of Bank ABC's mobile-only digital bank, ILA. Dr. Yusuf also held several roles in the bank, uh, managing different group-wide programs for the implementation of technology platforms across different business lines and geographies. Welcome, Dr. Yusuf. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. It's great to have you with us today. Um, Dr. Yusuf, uh, do we need innovation during this crisis? Do we need it more during this crisis? Um, first, Thank you, uh, Susie and Bahrain Fintech Bay for hosting me and for this uh, great and very important and critical topic. And the answer to your question is absolutely yes. But before I answer that, maybe just let's take a minute to agree that what innovation means and what specifically applied business innovation means. And, 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 and the basic words, innovation and in business is solving business problems that brings uh, value to clients and to customers. And sometimes it could be also to, to internal employees. And there are different levels of innovation. There could be like sustaining innovation and there could be disruptive uh, innovation. So it's different than creativity or than invention, which are things that might not end up with products in the hands of clients and customers that they can use to improve their daily lives. Now, do we need innovation in time of crisis? Absolutely, yes, especially when the crisis is bringing disruption at the global level, like what's happening now. And we believe that post the crisis, the world will be a different world. So for that, we need different business models and we need different operating models, whether it is a bank or any other uh, organization. And I think the question that every leader should ask himself or herself now how I will come out of this crisis stronger. And to achieve that, innovation will be a critical part of, of, of the planning. I saw a recent uh, survey done by one of the leading consultancy companies asking chief executives and senior people in different organizations, do you find opportunity or growth that from such crisis? And the answer of the banking executives was yes, at the majority, more than 70%. And they ranked uh, in the third level, just beyond two industries, technology, which obviously is it's gaining a tremendous growth and the packaged consumer goods because people cannot move. So they need those to be, to be delivered. And technology was, as I said, in number three. However, at the same time, they said they don't know how they were seized those opportunities or those growth, uh, growth that will come out from, from, from the crisis because of the changes in, in the different conditions. 
And I guess the answer to that is you need to innovate to seize uh, such opportunity. And I guess an advice to all organization is that if you play it safe at this time and you focus only on cost optimization without focusing on, on delivering new value, then most probably those organization will be declining. And seeing throughout history, we've always seen that crises are the center point where organizations that innovate thrive and organizations that don't innovate decline and, and eventually they, they just disappear. Absolutely, absolutely. So how can banks or financial institutions go about planning their response during these such difficult times as this? Yeah, so, so banks have, um, I, I guess, broadly two types of, of, of clients or customers. One is individuals, like in the example of, of retail banks, and then they have corporate or businesses from SMEs to large multinational corporates. And banks most probably can, can uh, plan their response during this time through what I call it the three R's. So first level is response, how my operations will look like tomorrow or next week. And this, I guess, all the banks went through and some of them had to make decisions in 18 hours that otherwise would have taken them 18 months to decide whether they want to use online collaboration tools or, or, or let people use other traditional means. Then the second phase is the uh, response, uh, or sorry, the recovery. And the recovery is starting now, we see it in some, some geographies, is how we will handle our clients, our employees, our stakeholders, our society, once the economies start to open up and once people come back to work, what, what are our plans? And then the most important phase is what I call it is the renewal. Because what I believe will happen is that the world will go through a process of a restart and not a reset. And with this restart, we need a renewal to our business models, operating models, way of working, how we deliver our products and services to, to our clients. So the three R's, I guess, is, is a good way to plan, a to plan during this crisis. Response, recovery, and renewal. Absolutely. Uh, Nikolai, what trends are you seeing with customer saving and investment behavior right now in terms of where you are at? Yes, thanks. Yeah, also thank you, Susie, for, for bringing me on here. Um, I, actually, I might steal Absolutely. the three R's. I really like the, the, that concept, actually. <laughs> um, now, for us, um, so one main theme that has emerged is probably that uh, the, the entry point for saving and investing is still with existing relationships that clients have, existing brands they trust, uh, existing institutions. Um, we, especially when we look back at the, the, the robo-advisory space and how that made big, big head waves, um, or big headlines, um, uh, maybe two, three, four years ago, uh, all of those standalone uh, investment propositions have have struggled with the with the high customer acquisition costs that haven't really come down since. Um, and on the other hand, you have banks uh, where ninety five percent of clients do do nothing but really plain vanilla banking activities. Um, it's it's credit accounts, current accounts, checking accounts, saving accounts, maybe, um, but then a bit of credit, a bit of lending. Um, but not much more than that. Uh, it hardly crosses over in investing. Um, and although uh, I think we've looked at research where 80% of retail customers say they are actually interested in receiving investment advice from banks. So that's a, a huge untapped potential, um, and that's the main entry point for, for customers. Then we have the, uh, the crossover yeah, from saving into investing, but where clients move a lot more freely between the two. And why is that? Because at the bottom line, um, clients have goals, and but but as clients, at the end client, they don't really care about how they reach those goals, um, but they want to reach them, and and we need to help them on on these journeys. So, um, also for the industry that we're in, uh, for 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 wealth investing, uh, investment management, it means to break down these barriers between saving, investing, pensions, insurance. Because at the end, retail clients, they don't care all that much. It's the outcome that matters. We just look at them differently because they're differently regulated. There's different underlying products, et cetera. Um, and this is actually where the UX matters a lot, where you incentivize the client to, to, to be activated and start saving and then maybe move over into investing without that being a massive ask in terms of usability. Um, I think we've there was a LinkedIn post going around that was last year or two weeks ago where you saw the number of clicks required to open an account with the challenger banks and incumbent banks and banks as well. Um, and there the, the UX matters a lot of how you onboard and bring a client into the proposition. 
And a lot of um, the challenger players, they also do, they don't onboard on the clients faster, but they also move them to do something with the deposit a lot faster. Um, and not all are, are equally good at this. So many, many challenges struggle heavily to, to generate revenue, of course, but they, but they have cracked the seamlessness of UX to a degree. Um, and that's clearly there. Um, and I think then finally, there's the, the personalization of the offering. Um, and if you, if you think back of, or if you think of how we consume other services, media, travel, e-commerce, for example, um, uh, we, it has completely changed from being packaged experiences to being personalized offerings that we even sometimes create for ourselves. Um, and what that means for the banking space is that you need to have you know, scalable processes that can onboard and propose you know, investment strategies and, and savings products and manage the backside of things for not only hundreds of thousands, but millions of clients, of course. Um, and we tend to forget a bit like what an amazing leap Netflix is in terms of you know, personalized media consumption because you're, you're able to program your own TV station. And that's enabled by cloud computing, by data exploitation, by highly modular and scalable architecture. And the, and the same, I think, uh, needs, uh, needs to be prevalent in the banking space to give clients what they expect there as well. Interesting. And how can fintechs help banks and financial institutions meet the current challenge and innovate more quickly? That's up to you, so we're saying. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's all about, right, how to deliver new value, uh, as you have said. Uh, and I think there's... There's, main, there's three main challenges. There's challenges inside banks where you have the, the old conflict of uh, you know, compliance and regulatory and governance matters running a lot of the, the business activities or, or influencing a lot of the business activities. Versus on the other hand, you are a service business which requires a personalized, individualized mentality. And those two things, I think those two forces, they stand in stark contrast to each other and work towards different goals. And it, I think banking means to engage in this balancing act of being you know, a bit of jackal and hype at the same time. And so I think they're partnering with fintechs uh, and to, 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 especially to achieve technology transition can be a method of choice because it, it pulls out of the organization some of the hurdles um, you, need to, you, know, you need to cross to, to achieve technological progress. Then you have, I think, challenges within the industry, within the banking industry. We've, we've mentioned the challengers. They have really changed the, the rules of the game. A lot of uh, categories they have shown consumers the other possible, I think. And now for banks, it needs to play catch up in, in, in a way uh, in terms of systems, but also the functionality is available to, to end clients. Um, I saw another study where um, I think that the, the, the feature richness within the apps, the average challenger bank app is 40% over what you are, can, can expect it in, 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 in a, an existing environment. Um, and then plus you also, you have the big tech players making an entry in, into the FS space. Um, mm -hmm. And so again, there, it will be important to, to import this culture of innovation where, you know, the, the, the method of continuous innovation through how development is run, um, but also how products are launched. I think if you can bring that into the organization with a, with a FinTech that then you're on the winning, on the winning side of things. And then finally, I think there's challenges from the outside um, where you have, you know, we have a low interest rate environment here, especially in, in, in Europe, of course, in the U S now as well, where you have a heavily, uh, it's heavily marginalized the revenue model of banks, of course. Um, and so for both challenger banks and incumbent banks, um, capital requirements will further increase also here in Europe under upcoming regulations. So the, the, the ability to create revenue is heavily constrained. Um, so you must tap into new resources for revenue, new sources for revenue you, with new products that ideally they impact your bottom line, but they don't blow up your balance sheet even further. Absolutely. So in general, this is a question to both of you. What do you see, with the, what does the future look like going forward from all of this? What do you see at this head? Uh, Yusuf or Nikolai? Yusuf, please. So I think the future will be dictated by the direction of the, of the pandemic, which is at the moment is uncertain, at least the short uh, future. On the longer term, I mean, from our organizational design perspective, I believe that organizations will rethink how they do strategy and how they execute their strategies. And we will see organizations running shorter cycles of strategies or will be introducing, similar to what they have now, minimal viable products, they will have minimal viable strategies. And through those shorter cycles of strategy, they will be able to navigate uncertainty because as we hear from the expert, this is not the last pandemic and we expect that other issues at the global level might come up in the near uh, future. And I think one also advice is to, to organization is, and maybe I've said it in the beginning, is we need to change the mindset from uh, cost optimization to value optimization, is how we best use our resources, our 
uh, financial capabilities to deliver value to clients and to our employees and to stakeholders. And all of this, I think, will require a rethink in how we do governance within organizations, especially banks and big banks. Over the years, have they tried to stabilize themselves? So they have introduced a lot of uh, governance levels, a lot of uh, processes that slow down decision making and slow down with introducing innovative products and services. So how can we have an adaptive governance that in areas where we need innovation, we can have faster ways to make decisions and then other areas where it's, maybe it relates to less moving areas in the banking industry still keep the safe and, and, and the standard governance. I think more or less this is how I see the, the industry is evolving here and it will be Interesting thing as well that, and maybe Nikolai can add on this, is maybe this is the first time that the fintech industry is going through a crisis because most of the fintechs were founded after the 2008 crisis. Uh, everyone is watching out now how the fintechs will be able to survive this crisis and come out as well from it, similar to banks, stronger. And uh, it will be very uh, interesting thing to see so maybe Nikolai can, can can add on that part yeah absolutely I think I'm um, the I mean there's always a cleansing element of course in in, in a crisis and uh, you I mean we mentioned the the challenger banks and I think you know while they have seen spectacular growth in some you know when it comes to, to user volume and, and user adoption there still is a long path towards revenue generation for a lot of them and I think that could be a major constraint now especially given the you know, the balance sheet constraints that they face um, where you if you wanted to engage in activity you would have to have a stronger balance sheet but you can't take that on right now because you can't raise the capital required um so yeah there will definitely be an um some sort of a uh, yeah um, uh, a, a, a south a southward movement for for some players i can imagine yeah um i think also there is the i mean what does the future look like i think the on the macro picture we have uh, there will be depressed consumer spending for, for a while, there's depressed business activity still, um, yeah, which means often a more tightening of the margin corridors um, for, for, for banks. Um, there's on top of it in the financial markets, you have in, largely increased market volatility where you know, fundamentals have really decoupled from, from, from the financial indicators to, to a very large degree sometimes. And especially there in the investing space, I think, then you have a double squeeze on, on, on if you're active in that space. On the one hand, you need to readjust internally how you work, you know, maybe still with, you know, your workforce, uh, your process is adapting to a remote environment. On the other hand, you have uh, high volatility where consumers and clients need a lot more attention and have a lot more um, questions uh, you know, around their money and how it's managed. So you have um, a double strain, I think. It will mean three things going forward. You have to focus a lot more on what's essential and cut activities that distract. Here, we, it was announced, I don't know how long ago, but that Monzo will cut its 24 seven a customer service uh, will be, you know, I think until 11 PM because they got rid of their Las Vegas customer care center. Um, I think it also means to increase the efficiency across all the functions, mostly through, through automation that's mainly achieved through, through technology adoption, I guess. And then, you can also, and maybe that's a play on the, the three R's actually that, that Yusuf mentioned earlier. That then you can again think about, okay, now what, 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 what new things can I do? How can I expand your new territory segments, markets where I'm currently maybe not active? So I think uh, one of the best, uh, most prominent examples of that is um, how Goldman Sachs and Apple partnered to launch the Apple credit card. Um, I think there's a bit of a misconception sometimes that big tech players will become as F players and they definitely don't. I mean, Apple has no desire to become a bank, but they have access to billions of consumers, billions with a B, and they will become the vendor of your products through their channels. And I think that's a very powerful element to then for banks to step into new territory. Absolutely. And, and go just talking about banks and how can they approach tackling innovation with FinTechs? Mr. How can they tackle that together? So, so with the fintech phenomena, let's say, uh, a lot of banks and especially the global and big banks have, have considered the fintech industry to be a source for accelerating innovation. And then they have established innovation labs, accelerators, et cetera, et cetera. And the model was that you either partner, acquire, or uh, invest in a, in, a, in a fintech to bring new business models in, in, in the organization, whether it becomes part of the main operations or as a 
spin off or a, or a separate entity. However, from, from my point of view, I see that there is no one single um, answer to uh, whether it is a partnership or competition or et cetera. How it depends on each unique problem that the bank is trying to solve or to innovate with. And then based on that problem, one FinTech could be your potential partner or it could be your competitor. The same thing that it is, for example, with other bank to bank relationship, because also banks need to work with, with other banks, right? So they need to have payment rails. So a bank in other region could be your uh, partner bank, while another bank in, in the same region might be your, your competitor. And I see also that another element that will rise from the crisis is that the role of big techs might change and the big techs might see an opportunity uh, because of the acceleration of, of, of digital acceptance among the populations all around the world, is that they might also rethink their strategy. So, so as a bank, we need to position ourselves how to handle our relationship with big techs, with fintechs, with other banks, and with traditional suppliers or, or vendors, and consider four of them as much as possible for source of innovation. Yes, and, and, and Nicola, I don't know if you have anything else yeah. to add to that. Um, yeah, maybe not. I mean, I think Yusuf has mentioned most of the elemental points, I think. Um, the, especially because he, he touched on you know, the decision that you need to make between the different approaches. And I think there you need, you need to make a, a very honest assessment of what skills do you have? Like, can you actually pull this off? Where this, but then versus how important is it actually that you, that you try to achieve this yourself um, or that you maybe go out and, and partner or, or invest in something? Um, how important is what you're trying to achieve for the differentiation in the market? And I think for building, um, of course, if it's a strategic aspect of the business and it's really elemental to create core value that sets you apart, um, if you strive for technology leadership, um, then that's then the building approach is the right one. But that, but I think it's easy to forget that building is an ongoing task. It never stops. This is why you know continuous, uh, agile uh, software development is at the heart of, of of how fintech operates or technology generally operates. Um, I think when it's about buying, um, when the technology is a function of a particular software solution and it's it's core to the success, but then owning the IP isn't that all that much, right? You would buy a solution. It saves you time. But then also you're beholden maybe to the service of that supplier. And maybe because it saves you time, it was a decision that was made under a certain time pressure. So it you know, probably prohibits a bit of careful buying decisions sometimes. Um, and I think that partnering, of course, you share the risk and the reward. So you partner um, with someone who has something available that's unique and complementary with your existing setup. Um, that's not e and it shouldn't be easy to reproduce, of course. So you rely on the technology prowess of someone else. But yeah, you share the the, the, the fruits of the labor uh, collectively, which is, uh, of course, it's um, uh, we we see a lot of benefit in, in in the last model, of course, yeah. And that brings us also. Do you see regional differences between the MENA region versus Europe, and impact on on banks' future evolutions? I mean, this is to both of you as well. Do you? See, do you see? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, most of all, um, one of the most striking differences between the, the MENA region and, and, and Europe is uh, I think the demographics are very different, the demographic setup of these societies. Here, um, a major topic, of course, is the wealth handover from the, uh, the boomer generation to millennials and, and below that will come over the next yeah, 10 to 15 years, probably, where it's a wealth transfer in the trillions of, of, of euros, of course, um, that goes from one generation to the next, um, especially there. Uh, in the context of investing, why is it why is it relevant? Because we know that for for wealth managers, for example, eighty percent of wealth managers don't have an existing relationship with the, the beneficiary of of, of uh, the the person whose wealth and, and money they're managing currently. Um, so that's a huge impact um, that you need to be able to solve to sustain your business. Then we have the the central bank environment here in in, in Europe, uh, dictated through the ECB, of course, it puts. Uh, uh, a special kind of framework in place in which banks have to operate um, with some of the pressures we, we've, we've mentioned before. Um, and I think also then the, and you have mentioned as well, where um, where the competition comes from in your in your home market, from which side does it come? Is it from within the industry where you have um, startup green fields touching and taking a slice of your pie? Or is it maybe the tech players or is it incumbents that are actually um, uh, innovating quite quite rapidly. So these are, I think, the, the, the most uh, yeah, 
pronounced differences between the two regions probably, but then uh, Yusuf knows the MENA side a lot better, obviously. Um, yes, so from my side, maybe I will, I will, I will handle the other side uh, of, of this question, or maybe I'll answer it in a different way, is the need for collaboration between uh, MENA, Europe, and all the regions. And, and from this pandemic, something that we saw is that collaboration and working together, it's becoming more and more critical. And it was maybe one of the first times in, in the history of big techs that they collaborate together in such a way we saw that Apple and, uh, and Google coming together and working one solution to help people with social distancing and tracing infected people. So can the same thing happen with banking, more collaboration? I guess this is what is needed. And on a technical level as well, we've seen how, uh, as an example, the cloud technology have enabled organizations, whether they are fintechs or other types to be able to cater with the demand and to be able to scale up quickly and to have a strong business continuity capability. So I think the world needs to come now together to put uh, regulations and agreement that allows data to flow freely across different regions to allow innovation. And uh, I think that will be a key element that everyone need, need to come together. Another example is maybe in the field of trade finance where paper documentations were a critical element that had to be there. And a lot of companies, they just used to fax or not so to pack to FedEx or send by courier tons of documents every day to banks. And now we've seen the international business uh, organization saying, okay, we want to stop this and we want to digitize the whole trade finance process. So I think from that angle, uh, collaboration need to improve and I, I've, I heard also a lot of talk saying supply chains need to be kept locally so that's fine as well but as well I think technology here can help with improving supply chains and having multiple routes and options and then some intelligent platforms can be introduced where supply chains if interrupted in one route can be automatically routed through other channels I think from that angle, I hope that this pandemic will bring the world closer. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. We have quite a few questions. I'm just going to dive right into them. Uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, he's asking Dr. Yusuf Almas, customer loyalty is important tip. What Illa Bank is going to do, what is it doing to keep customer loyalty and make it unique experience during the pandemic? I think he's asking a pretty, like, to keep, what are they doing in terms of customer loyalty? So I think, uh, uh, I'm talking here on behalf of the, of the ELA team, but uh, ELA Bank was able to, since it was launched in November in a short period of time, because the way the bank works and, and, and the agility mindset that this bank has, it was able to quickly bring frequent uh, innovations in, in the market. And the bank thrives on listening to customers and, and its, its slogan is a banking that reflects you. And for example, during the period of, of Ramadan, I understand from the team that a lot of people said to the, to the, to the bank the, through different channels, how can, can you help us to pay our, for example, zakat during uh, this month because we are not able to go and pay it in the traditional way. And the bank was able to quickly reprioritize its uh, product roadmap and give this function to clients in, in a quick way and then it, it it brought in customer satisfaction. And, with, and when you listen to your customers, you'll bring loyalty. And, uh, and ELA has a very exciting set of, of capabilities and features that are coming in the next few months that I'm sure will make customers more loyal and, and more happy. And, and they're all based on, on voice of the customer. And that's how the, the banking industry should be, should be functioning, I think. Absolutely. Um, another question is, I think it's both of you, what areas do you perceive as the most demanded for launching the innovations in the bank? I think it's for you, Yusuf, after COVID-19. What, what areas, I'm talking about what areas besides like you were saying, uh, maybe to do with uh, digitalizing some aspects of communications, but I mean, in general, you have somebody asking, uh, what, are, what are the most demanded for at this point in the bank? So I think we are hearing now from different parties, the concept of uh, low touch economy. 
Yeah. And this low touch economy is also accelerating the digital economy. So how banks can be drivers or enablers of this digital economy and low touch economy. And maybe one area is uh, payments uh, because payments still has a lot of opportunities for improvements. How we can make payments faster, easier, more seamless, not within a country, but at the global level. Why I'm able to send a WhatsApp message to my colleague who is in, in North America or to Nikolai in a few seconds, but if I want to send him money, it will take three days to reach him and with this amount of, of fees. So I think that will be one area. And then within the local domestic level, I think banks can do a lot to uh, reduce uh, the need to use physical items when you do payments, whether it is in a store or in, in other means. And then another area is maybe in the, in the, in the, in the in, in who, which for banks that deal with SMEs, for example, we have now the traditional credit scoring. Imagine you use this model now to give credit to SMEs. You will get zero approvals, right? So how can you now change your, your mindset and your, your model so that you are able still to assess the risk from SMEs in the new context, but be able to identify which one can get a credit line and which one cannot get a, a credit line. And we have to bear in mind that banking fundamentally did not change much it's a payment account it's saving and investment capabilities and then it's credit lines we had uh, several innovation but the basic of banking did not change and i'm hoping that maybe as a result of this pandemic and and, and crisis that the new radical change in, in banking business model will evolve and we will see maybe the spotify of the music industry similar in, uh, in, in, in the banking industry. And that bank could be from this region as well. I think it's a, you mentioned a very good point, the, um, the, that the nuances really matter because I think a lot of people or now in the, and we've mentioned it before in the context of COVID, it was kind of thought of this, it's, it's, you know, it's the nail in the coffin, coffin for um, anything that's an offline experience, um, but actually more the transitional elements of this experience and how these experiences will change and what, you know, what, what technology uh, can play a role there in the transition process. I think that's important to look at because the, on the one hand, we said, okay, these, these maybe omni-channel isn't that omnipresent anymore because now it will only be the digital channels. But then we also see that um, coming back to the investment and wealth space, 25% um, of, of clients of wealth managers, they they prefer face-to-face -face interaction with the human person, maybe not in person um, due to the restrictions of, of uh, COVID-19 specifically, but they still want to talk to a human. Um, so now if you still want to you know, create, create value for your client, you on the one hand, a major channel, the offline channel has disappeared entirely to do that. But on the other hand, you still have to deliver human interaction, but now you have to do it digitally. So it's not just a switch of, of, of removing uh, the, the human element entirely. And so you have to find the right balance between these two channels, but also then especially guiding the, the clients into the right channels. Um, the human interaction, it needs to be highly responsive and you need to have scalable processes to, to support the, the relationship managers um, to be as efficient as possible. And for those clients who are able to, to ditch the advisor or the, the relationship manager, you have to enable self-serving for as much as possible and guiding the client to the right landing point within uh, your channels. I think that's the, that's the important bit. Absolutely. I've got an interesting question. It says outside, is it uh, Bayan Jabri from uh, BNI? Hi, Bayan. Um, she's basically asking, like, can you share any of your insights that would for her industry, where she's in the insurance industry? I mean, she's like, from your from your knowledge and from your valuable insights, you know, could you sh kindly share anything to you know that you have, have in terms of your views for the insurance industry? Well, so, so we, we engage with insurance firms um, who, what, what insurance firms are really good at is ex building extremely long-term uh, and lifetime uh, value, with a high lifetime value client relationships. Um, what insurance firms are, are traditionally bad at is client engagement. Um, what you normally, you engage with your insurance, and that's the case predominantly, of course, for everything that's accident and emergency related. You know, think of your car insurance, think of a houseware insurance, or equipment insurance. You deal with your insurance in the case of a negative uh, event in your life. Um, with your life insurance, um, I've had a conversation with a German um, 
life insurance where uh, a product manager there told me, look, we have clients who haven't heard from us in 20 years and now the life insurance policy is up, uh, it, it reaches maturity and now I have to sell them something new but they don't even know who I am. They have probably forgotten that they have this insurance in the first place. Um, so there, um, coming back to what, what we work on and the solutions and propositions that we built, um, it's about creating higher engagement. It's about creating higher engagement tools um, that one, give you the possibility to just be contact touch uh, with your client and reach out to them, but also to use the opportunity touch points you have to upsell, cross-sell, uh, spread out the offering that you push towards your clients. Um, the potential there is a bit the same. You have very long lasting, extremely close client relationships, but it's a huge untapped potential to do more with those clients than just the standard offerings, much like we said before in, in the banking space. Thank you, thanks for that. I hope that answered your question, Bayan. Um, so we've got another question. Um, so this is Afro, Afroz from BFC Payments. Uh, he said, one of the most impacted segments, especially in the MENA region, has been the blue collared workers with limited access to technology, especially FinTech. What can be done to take technology to them? I'll leave that up. I think this comes, comes under the umbrella of uh, financial inclusion which should be a topic that is uh, close to the heart of every fintech and, and, and every bank. And I think one thing that on the positive side of uh, this pandemic is that it accelerated the adoption of uh, digital technologies across segments of people with different income, with different age levels and different uh, educational backgrounds. And I guess, the agenda for financial inclusion will, will change now and we'll see more acceleration towards uh, financial uh, inclusion. And I guess also the, in, in the MENA, the, the governments and, and the central banks are also pushing for the inclusion of uh, different segments and uh, of people in the, in the financial system to protect them and also to give them opportunities because when you include people in the financial system, they are able to take insurance, they're able to take a loan, they can grow their, their business. And if they are a, a blue color, they can you know, change, uh, send money maybe in a, in a better and faster way to, to their, to their uh, loved ones. So I think expect after the pandemic to see uh, a lot of uh, more initiative in the MENA region when it comes to financial inclusion. And, and we have to take into consideration that MENA is one of the highest regions in the world with the number of uh, unbagged people, whether they are blue colors or in, in areas outside the GCC where it's even the, the, the nationals that are uh, still excluded from access to, to, to banking. And on top of that, we have to take into consideration that the big techs will sooner or later tap on this area. And here then comes the role of uh, digital currencies as well as if banks and fintechs, they don't tap in these two areas, sooner or later, the, the big techs will offer you a WhatsApp-like capability to send money, to save money, to convert money as well. Yeah, I think the, especially yeah, all, all, everything you've mentioned, how you know, it's important that the entire ecosystem, um, and I think it, it, it's, there's uh, largely, um, across everything I've seen, there's a, there's a huge awareness for financial inclusion across the entire FinTech ecosystem. Um, you know, it's, it sounds very grand, but our, our vision is, uh, actually for the company of Nokoro, is a world where everyone has control of the financial future. And it sounds, you know, very cloudy and fluffy, but actually um, that's at the core of what, you know, the technology that we built, but that many others build as well is for. Um, it's not that and when we come back to you know, the world we operate in, investing, saving, wealth management, it's not that um, wealth managers or banks or whoever is the, the counterparty doesn't want to service um, someone who has a low balance, who has a low or has a low, uh, has a low ticket client potentially, but they, they simply can't. They can't because of either the, the processes inside the bank make it too costly or the regulatory layers on top of what it means to service a client are to bring the cost up to a prohibitive level. Um, so to work on that and reduce the friction, reduce the, the obstacles you need to cross to be able to service um, not only um, high net worth, not only wealth, not, on, not even only mass affluent, but mass market and below. Um, this is what uh, 
there's a major role where the technology can play in this process to, you know, in, 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 to reduce the, the unit economics that, it, that make it economically viable to do it, and that also make it attractive for the end client, you know, in, the, in, in terms of seamless user experiences that cross over between, you know, all the things we've mentioned before. Yeah, and, then, and to add, to, maybe as a real example in Bahrain, is that uh, AFS, Arab Financial Services, which is a subsidiary of, of Bank ABC, have collaborated with few, I think, banks in Bahrain, and they are offering the blue colors uh, and a debit card and the capability to track their uh, balances. And they've signed deals with few companies who have large number of blue colors. And now those people are getting their salaries into uh, bank accounts. And this comes also under the umbrella of what Bahrain introduced as the wage protection program. Interesting. Interesting. Is it Talak, I've got a question from uh, Mass Law. I can't pronounce it. She's from, or she, he's from Poland. Telecom operators is coming, are coming out with remote medical services to their customers. Do you find it a potential also for the banking to have also that kind of banking end customers as well to have, you know, remote services? I'm not sure what she means by remote services. I think she means, she means where they come to, they, they come to you. Uh, is oh. that, I, I'm not sure either actually, but. So does, does she mean that can I, now banking happen without us visiting a branch or a I'm, physical location? The banker visits you basically, right? <laughs> what? Well, I guess again, you know, it comes, it comes back to the, the to, to, to the core of what I just said, where um, that in, in the current world we live in, because of the you know the internal as well as external constraints, um, there's a there's there's a natural limit to how much that's possible because of how costly it is to do it. Um, to have a highly trained person come and visit you at your house to give you financial advice or, or provide banking services. Yeah, I think she met, she's she wrote just now medical consultation. So yeah, as you were saying, go on. Yeah. yeah okay yeah so i think the, the the route forward to to make that happen is one to if, if it's really human face-to-face -face interaction to reduce the friction uh and that happens through digital services i mean we, we do we do a webinar now i think by now we're all very 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 used to that mode of operation and that will be the the the, the primary uh, mode of operation going forward for a lot of these services and again um, for those clients who are, are ready and are willing uh, to forego the human element to have really attractive, highly intuitive, seamless user experiences that make it as easy as possible that you don't even need uh, the human interaction. Not, not for the fact that you shouldn't have that access, but it, makes the, the, it brings down the cost of providing that service you by so much that it's even uh, possible for you to, achieve, uh, to, to, to access something that wasn't accessible before maybe. And that's a good analogy because like in the medical uh, industry or domain, you still need physical interaction at, at, certain, at certain stage to do your diagnostics, etc. Well, in the banking, everything can be digital. All assets can be digital. So the banking industry should be much more beyond and faster than the medical uh, industry when it comes to fully digital uh, interactions. Yeah. And still, I guess that some banks and institutions will decide as part of their strategy that a human face-to-face -face interaction still will be required and will be maintained. And you never know because there is a lot of talk as well that even the digital-only banks, the ones that uh, evolved in the past few years, in the future, they might have places for physical interaction, even if it is not for customer service, it could be for marketing purposes. Yeah. That's an interesting one, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the most practical examples, if you think of KYC processes, right here in the UK, for example, we are based um, to, to onboard a client and do the KYC checks. You can rely on purely digital document verification. For example, in Germany, um, where I'm from, uh, you need to have a uh, a face-to-face -face interaction with someone who checks the, the validity and, and um, uh, authenticity of your documents. So how you go around that um, by avoiding actual having to go to a branch or have someone come to you is you do a video chat, right? And you have different methods within the video chat of moving image recognition, face recognition uh, to still uh, suffice the regulatory environment, but still, you know, take advantage of technology and the cost savings it brings. Yeah, and let me here give a real life example. Uh, let's take Bahrain as an example. So in Bahrain, digital signatures are accepted as a, as a legal uh, way. Uh, 
online onboarding is accepted by the Central Bank of, of Bahrain. So customers can do KYC completely online. While in other countries in MENA, a digital signature is not accepted. A paper signed is needed. And all of this have had great impact when the pandemic happened, when people could not leave, but they need a bank account. When people, they need to do a payment, but they cannot sign a paper. And, and I think uh, in MENA and in other parts of the world, the, the concept of digital identity now need to be accelerated and accepted across all uh, legal uh, systems. Well, I think, I mean, I think it was a wonderful talk and I, I don't know if you have any last words, uh, Nikolai and, and Dr. Yusuf. Uh, thank you very much as well for, for, for joining us today. And thank you to all the audience as well. I'd, I'll leave, Nikolai, I don't know if you have anything to say in the last few words. Um, nothing to add. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank, you, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. Dr. Yusuf, thank you very much for your time as well. Really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Do you have anybody, if anyone has any more questions, any follow-ups, you can contact us on info at Bahrain Fintech Bay. Uh, and we're happy to as well to put you in touch or to, to, if you want to find out more from today's talk. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye.